Welcome to the Fury Theory Podcast, brought to you by EFB Advocacy. EFB means excellent for business. This is the St. Patrick's Day edition of the Fury Theory Podcast. I'm wearing green. Adam Belmar's got a green hat on. John uh, Easton has red hair. And so all we're... John Easton's the E, Adam Belmar's the B, and I'm your host, John Fury, the F. We are glad to be here. We are not drinking Guinness but we want to because it is the St. Patrick's Day edition. Um, But if you are drinking Guinness over over the weekend, slauncha, and good health to you all. Theory one, thanks Congress for reforming your tax code. Leo Varadkar, the Taoiseach of Ireland, met with President Trump uh, earlier this week. The president gave him a little bit of a hard time about Ireland's tax code. Adam Belmar, we played a role in this debate. Can we go to that videotape right now? You bet. Hey, Adam, roll that beautiful beanie footage. (laughs) You know, Ireland elected our first female president in 1990. 25 years later, it looks like the US might finally be catching up. There are lots of ways Ireland leads America. Look at America's broken tax code and your shockingly high corporate tax rate. At three times the Irish rate, you just can't compete with us, and that's fine by me. Uh, Adam, let's just talk a little bit about how we worked on this. On this, uh, yeah, that was a great ad, and you know, it was really your idea. But it was like imagining during uh, the the years of advocacy leading up to um, the execution of a change to our corporate tax rate. What are the folks in Ireland thinking about? the absurd nature of Congress not addressing a huge economic disadvantage that we put ourselves at. And your thought was, well, I bet they're raising a beer, saying slancha, and thanking the American Congress for the good fortune that they're having. And that's really what it came to. And the funny thing about that ad is that that guy was not Irish, but we didn't know that. And well, no, uh, we kind of knew that. We, we kind of we knew that. But the, 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 the accent that he had so infuriated the Irish that when we gave that story to my friends at the Irish Times, they ran it on the front page of the story uh, of their website for many uh, for many uh, hours, and it got a huge response because uh, John Easton, the people did not, the Irish people thought the accent was terrible, um, but you know the fact is is that our tax rate has come down, and had, that has made the Irish a little bit nervous, and they should be, and they should be. Um, I, I think that uh, this was a very very big victory. Uh, especially for the president, since uh, he gets the the credit on this, and I, I think even corporate America was surprised that it, it got to that low. I think they were some, probably thinking more in the line of twenty five percent. But uh, I think that you know this is all good. The Irish should be worried as long as corporate America continues to remind everybody why this is a good thing that workers are getting uh, higher wages, that uh, they're getting bonuses, that good things are happening in communities across, the, across America. If they don't, then that tax rate could go back up again in a heartbeat. Well, you know, Adam Belmar, uh, earlier this week there was a special election in Pennsylvania, and Connor Lamb beat the Republican Rick Saccone, Rick Saccone, um, and Connor Lamb came out against these corporate tax cuts. And Saccone didn't really run an effective ad campaign against Saccone, really kind of advocating for those taxes to go back up. Now, how do you think this all plays out? Do you think these tax cuts are going to be a winner for Republicans, or are they going to be a loser? Oh, there, in my mind, there's no question that uh, the tax cuts are already bearing fruit. It's a big winner for Republicans. But the optics of elected politics and the framing of every issue within every community uh, is a little bit different, and depending on how uh, the rest of of the year goes, you know, one thing I would say uh, substantively is that there's a, a federal open markets committee hearing next week. It's the first one that's going to be chaired by the new head of the Fed, and people are expecting um, a increase of a quarter point in interest rates. That is primarily, as I understand it, indicative of a healthy, strong, growing economy. Um, not every element of everyone's economy is uh, is great. 
But this is a winning topic, and I, I just don't know how to address your question, John, about what happens as regards to the Pennsylvania special election. But well, I, there, I guess, I guess the question I have, John Easton, is that um, Lamb came out against these tax cuts, but the tax cuts clearly have helped the economy. They've helped, you know, they, companies now want to locate in the United States because we have a much better corporate tax rate than we had in the past. Um, and I do think that this, that Lamb has, was on the other side, as were most Democrats. So the question I have going into this election, you know, will this be a net winner for Republicans as we think? And I, and I think that only will be if we connect it to the economy. Do you think that's right? I do. I think like anything that, that comes out of Washington, it takes time. So there, there, there's going to be a time lag on the true benefits of this tax reform package, which, of course, included what we're talking about, this uh, reduction of the corporate tax rate to 21 percent. But as, as well as wages, hopefully those are going up, uh, the paychecks uh, getting larger. But all this is not happening at once. And so a special election that happens just months after this this bill was signed into law, I don't think everything has really taken effect the way it needs to. Now, by the midterms, Republicans hope that people are seeing a lot of, of benefits by then, and then certainly by, you know, the, the following election. But things take time. They do. Uh, Adam Belmar, I would make one other point on this. The corporate tax rate in Ireland has been 12.5% for about 25 years. Yeah, persistently. And all the political parties... The Fianna Foil, Fianna Gael, Labor, I think even Sinn Féin, they all agree with this tax, corporate tax rate because they all understand the economic impact uh, that has been very good for Ireland. Um, now, for the American uh, economy, this is still an open question. So if you're a business and you see Bernie Sanders, who is the kind of heart and soul of the Democratic Party, promising that if Democrats get control of the Congress, they're going to immediately increase the corporate tax rate. I mean, that is something that I think corporate leaders are like, you know, what's going on here? Well, you know, and I, I appreciate that Bernie Sanders plays a special role in the heart of Democrats. I don't take him seriously when he's running for president. I don't take him seriously when he threatens uh, Democratic control of the, of the Congress and changing this newly effective tax rate, because you know what? Uh, Donald Trump's president, at least until 2020, and he's not signing that no way, no how, and whatever majority they end up getting, which they won't, uh, is not going to overturn this great boon for the American economy. So, Bernie, slancha. <laughs> <laughs> Theory two, Irish need not apply. One of the subjects brought up by the Taoiseach with the president was the undocumented Irish. There's about 20,000 undocumented Irish. These Irish have been... Com- Did they lose their documents? Or were they-, they are undocumented. Oh, there are folks who decided that they had a visa and are not going back home. And I would, if I could, I could go back home. But there's about 20,000 of them. Many are legacies from 20, 30 years ago when the Irish economy was terrible. But now, obviously, the Celtic Tiger is back. But this is one of those issues that the... Um, the, the, was brought up by the Taoiseach with the president. Uh, we have a very good friend of ours who's the special envoy uh, from Ireland to the United States uh, trying to get this thing worked out. Uh, there are some questions, John Easton, as to whether immigration will be included at all in the, uh, the big omnibus package that's coming through. What are you hearing about immigration? Is it going to happen at all? Any portions? Of the president's kind of talking about doing some DACA deal. Mm-hmm. The Deferred Action on uh, Childhood Arrivals, uh, DACA, you're hearing that. Uh, Some stories are being written that uh, there may be some sort of a deal. One plan that was floated was a a three-year extension of of DACA uh, and, you know, for a three-year funding of the wall. So I'm not sure if that's really going anywhere. I think the signals from the White House is no. We're not not doing a a short-term deal on this. But I think that the bigger picture here is that DACA is tied up in the courts. And right now, it gets, it's, it's at the district level, and then it's going to go to the Ninth Circuit. Now, that's on fairly fast track. This will probably be decided by June, but then it's going to the Supreme Court. So we're looking at DACA being in its current state, which is the administration has to accept um, renewal applications, through the midterms. There is no urgency there. So you know, the two sides don't have much leverage here, particularly the, the, the pro 
let's get a DACA uh, thing done permanently, uh, they're not going to get anything uh, quickly. So I think that um, you're talking about uh, no urgency equals no immigration in the short term. So uh, Adam Belmar. And no wall. And no, no wall. wall. Adam Belmar, let's talk about this a little bit uh, in the context of the president, because once again, it was the president offering another deal on DACA which hopefully would include some some deal for the Irish, by the way, because I'm Irish and I care about that. Um, I'm Irish-American, I should put that. But um, so what do you think about the president, once again, trying to prove that he, he's willing to cut a deal on this? And does, does this put the Democrats in a tough spot? You know what? I think, uh, as John Easton just pointed out, uh, the facts on the ground sort of <clears throat> have led the Democrats to not being in such a tough spot. They can keep the high rhetoric and... You know, even though you can sort of see through that, that they want the issue and not the action, um, they're not ready to play, let's make a deal. They think they're in a strong position, which I think is really unfortunate because I think the president's attempt to make deals is a, is a, is a way of him saying, um, this is my strength, this is why I was brought here, and I want to reach out across the aisle. Give me something, I'll give you something. That is his stock and trade at bipartisanship he will be willing to make that compromise deal if they won't get involved, especially on an issue that means so much like DACA. I see very little evidence that uh, that we're going to make headway on the really big issues. And well, I find that disappointing. Yeah, and, and to, to add to that, I think that uh, the Democrats don't trust the president on this. They don't trust him on much. They really don't trust him on immigration, partly because of what happened the last go around. And Majority Leader McConnell and the Senate uh, the the idea that he might uh, burn another week or ten days on the Senate floor when he when they have so I mean look at the nominations they have ahead of them we have CIA State Department etc uh, they just can't afford to do something that's not already baked theory three Brexit Brexit so uh, the president was meeting with. Leo Radkar, who is the Taoiseach of Ireland, and what's on Leo's mind is Brexit. But was, what was on President Trump's mind was firing Rex Tillerson. Uh, what I th- find amusing about this whole thing is that if you're the Secretary of State, you're trying to handle this very important meeting with a uh, leader of an, another country, and uh, Rex is out, and he got fired as he was coming back from Africa, or while he was in Africa, mm-hmm. with a stomach bug, fired via yeah, I'm tweet. not sure about the whole stomach bug. <laughs> yeah, uh, buying it. <laughs> yeah, I had a stomach bug on Tuesday too. Anyway, let's go. Let's go. So let's talk a little bit about uh, what happens now. Uh, he's appointed uh, Mike Pompeo, who is a former CIA director. No, no, uh, he's current, current CIA CIA's director. Guy. Um, former member of Congress, mm-hmm. um, John Easton, thinking about this, is all hell breaking loose at the White House? A little bit, <laughs> a little bit. But as the, the three of us have, have talked uh, this week, it, it just seems like this is normal now, what we're seeing. Uh, disruption, uh, change, uh, getting rid of somebody uh, that he may or may not like. It, it just... I don't think it surprises anybody anymore. And and I think one thing that the, the Rex Tillerson episode proves is that with Donald Trump as your boss, it could be one strike and you're out. Now, it, it, it took Rex Tillerson a while for him to be out. But remember his comment? He called the president a moron. And I don't think the president really ever got over that. And and the other thing he did is he made moves within the State Department that I, I don't think the State Department was ready for. I'm not even sure the White House was really ready for all the really severe cutbacks and then policy differences. So, you know, we thought uh, you know, on this podcast that he'd be out at, uh, around Christmas time. And it was pretty shocking that he was still around by, you know, spring. Uh, but it was just finally enough. Now, I mean, if you are working in the cabinet, and you're, or you're working on the, as a senior advisor at the White House, and you make a mistake, and it could be a something that does not jive with Donald Trump's personality. You know, John, um, I agree with all you said. This was a long time coming, though. Uh, Rex Tillerson was as deeply unpopular in the White House as he was at the State Department, and everyone was kind of rooting for Rex Tillerson because he was someone who looked the part. I know I was. He looked the part of a statesman. He's got the white hair. He's got he's a guy who's got uh, 
those long kind of long experience in the business sector. But Adam Belmar, thinking about this, uh, Tillerson was terrible. He was a terrible Secretary of State. And um, you can't be Secretary of State and be at odds with your boss all the time and then piss off your own bureaucracy. Oops. Um, yeah, you know, I, I, I want to agree with a lot of what, what Easton said, but I sort of see this as truly March Madness hmm. at the White House. Yes, we have a level of chaos that we're used to. Yes, we have um, a sort of cadence to the president's decision making and change of wishes. But there's a real concentration of change here um, with the, the ouster of Rex Tillerson, the installation of Pompeo at state, which, as you mentioned, you both predicted. I had a different thought so on that, it. I think that's, so who do we think will take his place? You know who it is. Is it going to be uh, Pompeo? No. It's going to be the current... Uh, U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, mm, the I, former governor of South Carolina, Nikki that, Haley. That's, uh, I, think, um, I think it's probably Mike Pompeo. And, and, I see, um, and, you know, let's also understand that in the background, presaging the next turn, uh, word is that the president's national security advisor, H.R. McMaster, is being uh, primed to move, mm -hmm. maybe even promoted out the door. Mm -hmm. um, but I have to say, John, I have really no uh, no sympathy for, for Rex Tillerson. I, I'm not saying he did a bad job, but I think that uh, he was as politically inept uh, in conducting our foreign policy as he was in managing his personal relationship with the president. That's on him. Okay, he's a big boy. He took his chances. He did serve his country. But you know what? He got cross with the boss, and he got kicked in the touch. You know, John Easton, thinking about Ireland in the context of this, I, I've actually dealt with the Irish uh, Foreign Surf Service a lot. I know a lot of the ambassadors. They're all extraordinarily professional. They're not really political appointees. They're people who have been around for a long time. And no matter which government's in, you have the Foreign Service. You, theoretically, you have that at, at the State Department, and you do have a, 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 lots of professionals, although there are a lot of unfilled jobs. Mm -hmm. And what Tillerson was doing was kind of doing his own thing by cutting the hell out of the, of, out of the State Department bureaucracy, which I, I can completely understand. But he was doing it in, in a way that really the White House was disconnected to yeah, it. Right. Um, where is the State Department? Do we, do we think that they uh, – can they handle all these foreign crises? I mean, we have obviously <laughs> Brexit, but we also have um, – we have a real problem with, uh, um, you know, North Korea. Correct. Um, we've got this issue with Iran. We've got the Russians. Um, what do you think is going on? Yeah, I, I do, to answer your question, I do think that the State Department can handle it, even though that their boss is gone, uh, shown the door quite quickly. But I, I think that in terms of Mike Pompeo quickly being named the, the nominated to be the successor, I think the Democrats have to be careful here on what they do, because what, what you're reading now is you're reading reports out of, out of the, the Senate that, oh, he may not have the votes. Well, the Democrats can't say on the one hand uh, what's going on over there, and they, you know, there, there are vacancies and, 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 it's, and it's chaos in the State Department, and on the other, not let his guy through. This is uh, sage advice from a former Senate chief of staff. I mean, I, I you're, just... You're absolutely yeah. right. I mean, you got to... And, and Mike Pompeo, he's a former congressman. He is, he, he is the CIA director, and I think he's got a lot of clout in this town. And I think he's got a lot of clout on the world stage. Got to give the guy the job. Well, I, I think that's absolutely correct. And uh, I think what's even more important to, to recognize, perhaps, is that the pushback in the Senate is not all Democrat at the moment. Rand Paul is throwing up, yeah. you know, his hand and saying that I'm going to I'm going to hold up the nomination. Can I can I just enumerate a little bit more about Mike Pompeo um, in his background? He served in the United States Army. He was a captain. He was over in uh, Europe at the end of the Cold War. He served in the first Iraq war. He is a Harvard educated lawyer. He is a former businessman. He served in Congress, and he, of course, as you say, continues to serve as the as the director of Central Intelligence. Very formidable individual, very smart, strong credentials. Now, do you agree with him on everything? I got to tell you what, personally, I have not always agreed with uh, Pompeo's politics, but I think he's a credible choice. And just for the sake of our own foreign policy and credibility on the world stage, as we move towards 
a summit with the North Koreans right. that the former Secretary of State didn't find out about until after it was announced. I think for everyone's sake, let's get the new guy in the chair, okay? And Johnny, so I want to, real quickly, I do think that one of the things that Mitch McConnell is thinking about is that he's got to spend a lot of floor time on all these new appointees, and that, that, that makes the omnibus even more important because if you don't have a lot of time – uh, on the schedule, that means you're going to throw as many things as you can in that big grab bag of stuff, which I think also probably will include some some DACA stuff if they can get a deal on that. Uh, because all the other times we've taken on judges and taken on confirmations for Mike Pompeo and whoever else is going to the CIA and you know the whole nine yards. What do you think about that? Well, it's funny. The uh, a friend of mine in the Senate uh, was telling me the other day that. They almost feel like the Senate's becoming an HR department right. you know, for the for the executive <laughs> branch. And but if if Donald Trump is in the White House and he is as sort of erratic about his cabinet and, and senior advisors that need confirmation, well, the Senate is going to become an HR and a de facto HR department. You're exactly right with with regard to the omnibus spending bill. Remember, this is still the 2018 spending bill that should have been done last last Thank September. You for reminding. That's so true. It is, and 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 the longer it hangs out there, the longer uh, the bigger it gets, which is always the case with spending bills in, in the United States Congress. But um, not hearing a lot in the Senate, uh, the the House. I think their bill is going to be done, written, and maybe even introduced, announced on Sunday. But the Senate's very quiet on that front. Uh, my hope is that the Senate just is sort of taking the House's lead on this, and they can just get this done quietly, quickly, off the floor. <laughs> so, uh, John and Easton, what are you buying or selling today? Um, I'd like to, to buy and sell, if, if you, that's a... You better hurry. Okay. <laughs> Real quick, I'm going to buy... This is going to be a shocker for you D.C. denizens. I'm going to buy the Department of Motor Vehicles... Um, Emission Center in Southwest DC. Half Street. Half, Half Street. Street. Half Street. I went down there this morning at 8 a.m. I had just uh, my annual emission sticker, and nobody was there. I just pulled right up, and my car was through there in about that, two minutes, and I drove off. Unbelievable. So let me get this straight: you got up early and went down to Southwest to have someone check your tailpipe. <laughs> and right. your tailpipe felt good. Yep, it's all good. Right. And they were as friendly as could be, and there was no line. That's incredible. I am going to sell the University of Arizona Wildcats <laughs> basketball team. For those of you who do not pay attention to history and took them into your final four in your brackets. Nancy Pelosi. What are you on? They, speaking of crapping out, they crapped out again last night in the first round. Lost the number th- uh, 13th seeded Buffalo. Um, history repeats itself. I did not take them far because I remember history. So for those of you Wildcats um, in your brackets, I'm sorry. I love it. Nancy, did, Nancy Pelosi picked him to go to the, the final game, by the well, way. Good for she her. knows nothing about basketball. Adam Belmar. All right. I am selling two things. If you've been paying close attention to the chaos in Washington, you might not have heard about this. But for those of you outside of the cone of chaos, let me tell you, United Airlines has had a very bad week. And so I'm selling United Airlines because they forced a young girl to put her puppy in the overhead compartment and the dog died. Um, It is a horrendous mess for which they are taking, quote unquote, full responsibility. So selling United Airlines stock. And you know what else I'm selling? Pet travel insurance. (laughs) Don't be too sure on United or any other airline. Don't put the dog down below. Don't put him up in the cabin. You know, maybe you just don't fly with the dog. But if you do, Adam Belmar is going to sell you some pet travel insurance. John? Uh, a congressman, Dan Donovan, actually just introduced legislation making it illegal to put your pets up. Yeah, in this is very So did Senator to... Cassidy of Louisiana. Oh, so, uh, Senator Cassidy. That's right, right. Was it Cassidy or, mm-hmm. or, or uh, Kennedy? Ke- it was Kennedy. John Kennedy, right? Kennedy. Kennedy, right, right. But the, the thing that's really troubling on a week when uh, my kids – walked out uh, of school uh, to commemorate or to, to memorialize the loss of life down in Parkland in protest and, and asking for Congress's attention on gun control. 48 hours after a dog dies uh, on a United Airlines flight, Congress puts a bill in the hopper to, il- to make that illegal. And three weeks since Parkland, and we still have no true legislative attention on gun control, give me a break. I am buying 
Ireland. I'm buying Ireland for a couple of reasons. Their, Is interest rates low? It's, their Taoiseach, Leo Varadkar, is an inspirational leader. Uh, he's uh, of Indian parents. Um, his, his father is uh, actually Indian. His mother is Irish. Uh, he is gay. Um, and the, for Ireland, which is an overwhelmingly Catholic country, to uh, elect someone as their, their country's leader, who is not only uh, uh, not full Irish, half Irish, half Indian, and, and gay, is extraordinary. Um, but Vradkar has a, a, a vision to double Ireland's footprint worldwide. And I think Ireland is an unbelievable place to do business. The corporate tax rate, 12.5%. They have the most educated uh, workforce in all of Europe and probably all of the world. And I would also say that because of Brexit, they will be really well located for uh, American investment uh, into the EU. And it's going to be a huge uh, – Ireland's got a lot of bright future ahead of it, and um, I, I'm buying Ireland. And if, on St. Patrick's Day, why wouldn't I, right? Why wouldn't you? Um, so uh, welcome to the Fear Theory Podcast. We are glad that you're here. Slauncha to all my Irish friends. Uh, happy St. Patrick's Day. And uh, hopefully this will <laughs> this broadcast we'll will be fully produced. If anybody can produce uh, this, Adam yeah, can. This, it's all going to be good. So uh, EFB means? Excellent for broadcasting. <laughs> Let's hope so. <laughs> <laughs>